So we seem to have got ourselves to week four already, which is kind of a little bit of a surprise. Had you realised how quickly time is going by, folks? A bit worrying? Well, first of all, thank you for most of you who've been to the various workshops this last three weeks, and particularly last week's. And I think that one of the things we discovered during those workshops uh, on the Tuesday is that <coughs> many of you got some really great ideas, and uh, you're going to develop those. We'll talk about them again tomorrow. And I trust that you've all done lots of research to really begin to narrow down your ideas to that particular focus that's going to get you at least the possibility of an, uh, an approach which can demonstrate changes to society and industries and businesses um, now that we're into the 21st century as a result of those changes. What I want to do first is to show you how you use the template. While I've got everybody here, it's easy to go through it once and uh, then demonstrate it and uh, tell you how to do it so that you've got the instructions clear in your head. So first of all, you go to assessments and you find this SVLN prop 1104 dot dot, the template document. And you just download that and store it in a convenient folder. A folder where you're going to actually store the document you create from that. Now because it's a template and it has some macros sitting <coughs> inside it to help you do all of the editing, or sort of formatting, um, you have to open it in a very special way. You cannot open it into an existing open word document. Um, you can't pick it up from inside Word. <clears throat> you can't double click on it. What you have to do is this. And I can show you where I've downloaded it onto the desktop here. You right click on it and then you, type, you click on the open button. And with a little bit of luck, it might or might not work. It doesn't seem to... Oh yes, you can see here it generated this new tab, which you've probably not seen before, add-ins. And there are all of the little buttons you use for formatting. H1, H2, H3, H4 provide the formatting for headers 1, 2, 3 and 4, and so on. So you've got a bullet list, a dashed item list and a numeric list. You've got um, the list level, which sort of indents you one up or one down. The normal text is a very, very important button because it doesn't actually use normal, it uses body text. And that's important that your main text is formatted with that button or with the body text, otherwise it will not actually look right. Um, what else do you need in there? Bibliographic item on the top right. That helps put things into the bibliography in the correct format. Um, if you happen to want figures or tables, then you can see the figure caption, table <coughs> caption. And then at the bottom you've got title. That's for the very top bit. Subtitle. <coughs> author. Address. Email URL. Each of the lines in the, um, at the top of the first page need to be formatted with those particular macros. And then you, um, you've got abstract and keywords, again, two sections that you put at the top of your first page of content. And in, at the bottom, or the bottom of the title page, you will insert the table of contents, which doesn't appear on here. So you just insert table of contents uh, using the normal sort of approach, which is insert and no, sorry, references, and then you'll go down here. And I advise you to use the basic one at the top, or you could use that one or that one. I don't mind; they're both pretty close to the same. Um, and then you have a really nice formatted thing. Now, like all. Uh, 
um, templates in Word that you can ever find, they're all rather fragile. So it will probably be better for you to work in an ordinary Word document, first of all, build your outlines using header 1, 2, 3 to build that structure, then you start filling it in, and then when you're really happy with it and the word count is sort of about 1,500 odd words or so, then I would suggest you then copy it and paste it into this uh, for document here and make sure that you use the option where it can hopefully pick up some of the formatting. If that doesn't work, and it may or may not, again, it's part of exploring how templates work. Would you use merge formats or would you use key text only? Um, it's, as I say, if you merge format, bring the format or bring it in and use the formats in here, it might work. But it's part of the exploration you need to do to understand how these sort of templates work. Because if that doesn't work, the thing is, don't bring any format, just bring the text across and then format it with those buttons in the add-ins section. Now, what you now have to do is do the save as, and remember, you're not saving it as a template, you're saving it as a Word document. Otherwise, if you just save it as a .dot, it becomes a complete and absolute catastrophe and nightmare. So you save it as, a, as that, give it a different name, um, let's say, Impact on <coughs> something like that. And with a bit of luck, it ends up on now. as a macro R, that's why. You want to have it as a full one there with macros available. So we have a little bit of a problem here, so because the security is too tight, uh, tight on this one, I can't save macro free. You need to be able to save a macro enabled one. So we, you'll have to do that on the ones in our lab or on your PCs at home and that won't, shouldn't be so much of a problem, but there's obviously an issue on this desktop here. Because, so we'll cancel that out for a moment. Um, <coughs> But if you need to, there's an alt another one thing you can do is customize the ribbon and you need to add in uh, one other edge to see. Sorry about that, I'll have to track down. I thought I'd got it working upstairs. Um, it's obviously not working on these machines because of the security. You must have macros available. And there's another little section I find, which, will, which obviously is hidden on here, which we can use in our own labs, PCs and at home. And I'll find that for you um, for tomorrow. Sorry about that. Typical of this sort of place. So, a little bit, basically, you've got to get those macros working, you've got to save it as a, uh, the latest version of a Word document to docx, and then you'll be able to apply those uh, <coughs> things quite happily, those macros. What you will also need to do is to make sure that you keep your document in the same folder as that uh, little template lives in, otherwise <coughs> it can get quite badly confused. Make sure they stay in the same folder and then you'll be pretty much okay. So a little bit more work from me for tomorrow and then I'll be able to tell you exactly and I'll put the instructions back up on uh, in course resource.
resources in the assessment section, so you've got very clear instructions as to exactly how to do it. But you don't need to worry about using it just yet, because you'll find it much easier to work in the, an ordinary Word document. And that's the case with almost every single template you will ever find. So today, I want to start thinking about being an independent learner. <coughs> right. One of the important things about university, one of the important things about doing a course like this is it prepares you for the fact that things don't stay constant for very long these days. If you go back to when I started uh, my sort of university career and career at the Rolls-Royce Aerospace, now, we kind of knew that things didn't change very fast, that what we learned at university kind of now, it would probably be there for the next three, four, five years. And that we would stay in the same company probably most of our 40-odd <coughs> years of working. That doesn't happen any longer for some reason. <coughs> what we need to do is to learn how to learn. Because that's what we're going to need to do all of our life. We can't sort of say, tell the world, stop, I want to get off here, I want to stay as I am. We have to continuously develop our ideas, broaden our background, broaden our understanding, we need to read widely, and then from that, learn how to identify the right sort of questions and then the right sort of answers in a particular context. So, one of the things that government and advice, all sorts of advice are telling us is you need to learn how to learn because that's the most important thing for your career. And even in my day, when I, did, I spent, what, one year, my final year at university, doing computer science. And <coughs> once I got to Rolls-Royce as a, a trainee systems analyst, there was very little that I'd learnt during that year that was directly applicable. A whole lot of concepts did apply and were very, very important. But most of the detailed facts didn't apply. Seven of the eight languages that I learned how to use during that year weren't relevant. But the in directives, I never used things like Lisp or ML1 or reverse Polish notation. I never used Algol. But understanding how languages work, how the grammars and the syntax and the rules all work, helped me to understand how to use the programming languages that I had access to as a, a, a graduate, <coughs> as a trainee systems analyst and then as a systems analyst. And that background from 30, 40 years ago still helps me as I learn every now and then a new language either here or at Rolls-Royce. I learned two new languages at Rolls-Royce which I picked up quickly because of the background of understanding those different classes of languages. And they helped me to learn new languages quickly. And as I develop into SAS and SAS JMP, and into some of the IBM products that we're beginning to use here uh, in the analytics field, that background from 40 years ago is still helping me to learn new ways of doing things. And so I want to look at some of the critical things that you need to be picking up very, very quickly so you can become an effective learner both here <coughs> and for the rest of your life. <coughs> Now, this set of slides was built around a, a, sort of a much more interactive environment than we can actually run here, uh, because you aren't all online, you can't do all of the details 
as set out here, but you can do those by yourself later on. We'll do one or two of the little exercises um, and you'll be discussing things with each other for a couple of minutes or so. <coughs> and then feeding back. But think, uh, what I want you to do is to go through this whole set of slides later on by yourself or in small groups uh, of your friends working together in the atrium perhaps or in the labs whenever you've got a bit of time spare and start thinking about how can you learn? How can you take responsibility for your own learning? And it's based on a book by uh, Lowe's Peters and a couple of other authors and it's quite an old one but it's a brilliant book for helping you to understand yourself. Although it's written for overseas students, it's, the title is to do with um, if you're an overseas student coming to the UK, how can you learn in our environment? But it's also very, very valuable to people who've grown up in the UK, in the UK educational system. Because it asks interesting questions that you need to think about. So the first question is motivation. <coughs> what motivates you? And, you know, why are you here? Now, do you like your course? Do you know what the aim of your studying is? Do you even know how to study? So here's the questions that are posed as sort of pretty firm statements. These are the answers you should have to the questions like, do I like my course? Do I know what my aim is? Do I know how to study? Do I know how I learn best? Have you only ever thought about how you learn? One or two nods. Anybody, any shaking of heads so I, you don't have to put your hands up? Some of you don't know how you learn? Or the best situation? Time management. And that, we'll see how time management comes into this. Not just in schedule, <coughs> having your little work program, a diary or something set ahead, a schedule. But also knowing when the best time is to do particular types of studying. When can you spend an hour or two reading without immediately falling asleep? Because I'll bet there are times of day when you can spend an hour or two reading quite happily and making notes, and a little bit later or a little bit earlier in the day, <coughs> an hour vanishes and you've not read anything. You just kind of drift off. We're all like this. So, and then for writing, when's the best time for doing the writing? Best time for thinking about things. Do you know how to find and use the right resources? How many of you have started getting into the sort of library system here at the university, the electronic side, or the paper side in the library, to find resources? Do you know how to use the catalogues to find a book? Do you know how to use the, the um, electronic resources for journal articles and journals and so on? Because if you don't, this is the time to get really into those. So, not five minutes, you'll need to spend ten minutes probably at home individually, but just <coughs> briefly, I'm going to put this back up again, and I want you to think about those, and what your real answers are if you put a question mark after each of those. Do you really like your course? Do you really know what your aim is? Is it just to get lots of money? You know, computing, or field of computing, is a good field for getting high paid jobs. But the question then is, do you like the subject? Because if you only go after a career because you see large numbers of pound notes falling out of the sky, but you're not happy with it, that might be a problem long term. So, have a quick look at those and then <coughs> give me a few answers in, in a couple of minutes.
So first things first, you've had three weeks, do you all like your course that you're doing? Pardon? The grand. Okay. Because you see, if you don't like it, there is an opportunity, I think, for this week where you can possibly uh, change courses. It's getting a bit late, but uh, it's still possible. <coughs> Do you know what your aim for studying is? Why are you doing the program that you're doing? Any good, good ideas as to why you're doing it that you'd like to share? So those of you who are doing BSC IT, Information Technology and Analytics, why do you think you're doing it? No? Okay, those of you doing computer science, why are you doing computer science? No? Forensic investigations. Nobody want to share their ideas? Okay. Do you all feel that you know how to study? Or are you beginning to discover that it's a little bit different to what you thought it was as you left school? Any differences? No? Gosh. How many of you really do think you know when you should best do the different parts of the studying game? Some of you seem to know. Does that mean that most of you don't know how to work, when you do things best? Because we'll look at that in a few minutes. Your responsibilities. <coughs> Some of these you've already signed up for as when you actually enroll, signed your enrolment form. And yet, still there are people who seem to be missing, something like 35 people missed their uh, workshop last week. Now obviously all of you here are certainly here for the lectures, which is useful. And we haven't had anybody arriving late, so <coughs> congratulations all, and I mean that seriously. Do all the set work, and that's part of what you signed up for on the enrolment form, that you do what you're set. So, <coughs> that means you're going to look at this, spread, this um, presentation this evening and go through all the little exercises to really write, and write down your answers to the various questions so that you know that you really do know the answers to them. Just looking at them like you did just now for a couple of minutes without writing any notes means that you haven't really got to grips with the questions and particularly the answers in the present context. <coughs> background, any other recommended text, that's always very, very important. We do actually are fairly careful about the reading that we recommend for you. We don't try to give you too much. And I don't know how many of you will have seen the announcement I sent out, um, at least to the IT program, <coughs> and I'll copy back into this module another announcement for the guest lecture, a, well, it's an inaugural lecture for a visiting professor from Rutgers University in the States who is here t on Wednesday, and his whole hour of presentation is all about big data analytics, and modelling and how we can get to grips with all this amazing amount of data that's sculling around out there in the big wide world and the internet, uh, from Internet of Things, all of the sensor networks. And it should be a really fascinating um, lecture to listen to as he brings us some new understandings. So it's kind of nice for you to be able to go to that as well. Yeah, we tell you when the assignments are coming in, at least we tell you verbally, we tell you in the assignment specification, we may even tell you on the um, 
blackboard part of assessments. And then you'll see when we set up the submission points as well, the little date will appear there also. Yeah, it's your responsibility to make sure you submit to the right place at the right time. Um, one of the big things that's going to affect all of you is keeping a watch for when your computer-based test will be held in early January. <coughs> It will, you'll be able to find out the, time, the timing of that <coughs> from Blackboard. Wayne will publish that uh, nice and far ahead, but it will be in the first, about the first week or so of January, so you will have to be here for a, uh, a day then. There will be a schedule set up for you to go to a particular set of labs, or our labs up on B2, and you will be put into different labs to do the CBT. If you miss that because you hadn't noticed when things were that happening, because you hadn't watched the announcements from Wayne, you hadn't gone and looked at the exam timetables through the timetabling system and so on, you know, it's your responsibility to go there. And every year we get a few students who say, oh, I didn't notice, I didn't see the announcement, and I couldn't find the date, I couldn't find the time. <coughs> what, shall I, what shall I do? And the answer is, well, that's tough. You've lost the opportunity to pass with flying colours. Because you'll then do a referral for that. And that won't help. And when you've got an exam, and that CBT next term is an ex uh, example, <coughs> you have to be there before the start. And this last but one but, uh, bullet point. Now, here is an opportunity when I or Wayne are in front of you, or in this module, or any of the other tutors are in front of you in the other modules. We do not mind, as a general rule, if you put your hand up and say, sorry, I don't quite understand that. Put your hand up if there is something that you want clarification for. And we will do our best to make things clearer for you. And the last one is absolutely <coughs> critically important. Your health and your well-being. And you'll see around the university at the moment all sorts of notices about <coughs> well-being. <coughs> it's really, really important that you look after your health. And if things are going wrong, go and talk to your programme leader, your personal tutor, the well-being people that are being mentioned on the various signs, <coughs> uh, electronic signs around the university at the moment. They can help you. We can help you if things are going wrong. It might be financial problems, it might be family problems, it might be health problems. Come and talk to us before things go really, really badly wrong. If you tell us early, we can help you in various ways. If you come along after a submission point and say, oh, I had X, Y, and Z problems that caused me, has been with me for the last five, six, seven weeks, and you tell us after that <coughs> submission point or after the exam should have happened, we really are very, very limited in what we can do for you. But if you come to us as soon as such things begin to go wrong, we can help you. There's lots and lots of people in the university, academics and support side, who can really make a big difference to you and protect your options. <coughs> so look after your health, look after your well-being. It's your responsibility. We can't do it if you don't tell us. Oh, the other thing, go back, going back to those statements there. Think about what are the consequences if I don't do one of those or any of those. Because there are going to be consequences if you don't. And you need to understand what those consequences are so that you and look after yourself properly.
Now, motivation. And it's all about why are we doing what we do? And there's a lot of um, research in psychology all about motivation. What makes us <coughs> fired up to do something? And the experts say there are two sorts. There's from outside, what they call with a long, long word, extrinsic. And then there's the ones that are internal, the ones that I put on myself to be great. Or not, as the case may be. Are you working just because you want to get good marks? Do you like having people telling you you've done a great job? Do you do <coughs> things so that people say, yeah, great, you've been helpful. They were giving you approval for what you are doing. Or is it internal? That sense of achievement for doing a great job. Or helping someone. Is it pleasure? I just love studying. <coughs> Which of those are true for you each? One of the interesting things is that in, well, I, things have changed a little bit of late in the last two, three, couple of years or so, two, three years. But until about four years ago, all the way through my life at Rolls Royce, no one, not one single manager ever took the trouble to find out what motivated any of their staff. They made an assumption that it was probably just the money and promotion. They never, ever took the trouble to understand any of their staff as to why they wanted to do what they wanted, why they did what they did, why they felt they wanted to do a really great job. If they don't ask, at least you need to know what you, uh, what motivates you. You want to do that clearly, and again, as the little exercise after this shows, think about it and make some notes. That act of making notes helps you to bring it out, be certain that you actually understand what you've done why you've made those decisions. So if you say it's a sense of achievement, then sort of carry on and expand upon that little note. What is it about that sense of achievement that really makes you fired up to do a good job? Fired up to study here effectively? Fired up to get a great uh, assignment completed? So have a think about those, whether it's extrinsic, external rewards, or that internal sense of, wow, I've done a great job. I can see that I've done a great job. And one of the things that probably what you'll find over the next few years, <clears throat> particularly if you've got fairly good grades, fairly good marks, you'll come back to some of your assignments and think, did I really write that? Is that really my, 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 my writing? Did I really do that amazing piece of research? with 30 sources in the bibliography. Wow. That's kind of a, a rather fun feeling to have every now and then when you look back at some of the best work you've ever done and think, yeah, I actually did do that. And that's the sort of thing that maybe is what really does fire you up. In which case, that's fantastic. If it's extrinsic, <coughs> then there's a little bit of a problem because if, if you don't get those extrinsic rewards, the, the praise from your boss or the people around you, if you don't get the good marks or the merit money or the performance review uh, bonuses, and you're looking for those, then you're going to be dissatisfied. So it's often better if you can find your way to those intrinsic, your self-rewarding, you know, the feeling inside you, I've done a great job. And then you get the bonus if, so, if the boss or someone outside said, hey, that's a great job. Or your academic, your tutor says, that's a brilliant job. Now, those are things that can help as well. And we try and remember that. And one of the things you need to think about, this balance between extrinsic and intrinsic <coughs> reward, is 
<coughs> which balance is going to be best for you? What helps you to be the very best at learning and achieving in your assessments? Now, quite a large number of you have come pretty much straight from college or school. Some of you have left school and you're sort of coming back into the field of education. Um, and I did that in about 1999 to do my Master's in Law. And you have to think about how did I learn before coming here and how is it changing? Because you're already seeing a lot of changes, I suspect, in the way that you were studied at school particularly. If you've been to um, a college, you may well have migrated somewhat into the style of learning you need here. <coughs> <coughs> did you like it when you were taught everything <coughs> by the teacher, or did, you, or did you like it if you were at college and you were given some guidelines and then told to go away and do some learning by yourself? Because here, you're going to get much, much more Here's the guidelines, the outline, and go do the research in that seven hours or eight hours per module outside of the university or outside of lectures and so on. But how did you study your A-levels? Did you like it? Did you find it effective? Or did you like guidelines <coughs> and then going and following your nose, following your research? Think about what you liked about the previous styles of learning and teaching. What did you like? What was difficult about it? Did you enjoy it? And when you've done all of that, think about the question, what actually helps you to learn? So you've got some examples of things that worked well in the past. Some examples of things that weren't quite so good because you didn't really cope too well with it. <coughs> and now you've got to start thinking about, okay, I'm in a different environment here at the university. In an environment where you aren't going to be taught everything, we don't have time to give you all of the information, we'll point you where you will find the answers. We'll point you to where you'll find much of the information you need about the questions as well. So, all sorts of ways of looking at your past learning and comparing that with where you're going to be, where you are now, and into the future. And remember that the next three years, actually, while you're in the university, excluding, of course, that middle year of your placement year, for those of you who are going to do that, you have got more opportunity, more time, more resources, more access to resources than you will ever have again in your life. So make the most of that as well. So the question is, do those old methods work for you? <coughs> so to do that, you need to ask yourself things like, what was that method that worked for you? And compare it with how you see things are happening now. Think about the usefulness and then the value and relevance when you're now that you're here at the university. Does that style still work for you? Are you going to be supported by the tutors <coughs> in the same sort of way? And now you need to start thinking about what's happening here. So as I say, for many of you, quite a different way of working. Have a look at those two URLs and do the tests that are there. Learning styles and <coughs> knowing yourself. You see, what I'm really concentrating on for the next two or three uh, lectures is very much, at, well, most of the way through to the end of the term, in fact, is very much about getting to know yourself in ways that you probably, or most of you, I suspect, haven't ever done, because you've not needed to. And it's really quite interesting beginning to know yourself, not with rosy tinted glasses on, but a really harsh, clear, cold examination of yourself. 
Because only by doing that will you be able to make <coughs> the right choices to be able to move forward, both here and then in your future life, in your future career. Studying when? Now, I've always worked better later. Like many students, I used to do many of my assignments in the <coughs> days when we didn't have PCs, handwriting on A4 pieces of paper uh, late into the night, so 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. I don't function too well terribly early, especially if I've gone to bed late, obviously. So the question about when to study is very much about very clearly understanding yourself. Your energy levels. When are you most alert? Do you like <coughs> getting up early and doing a lot of work early? I mean, when I was teaching down in Southern Africa, in Malawi, Botswana, many of the students there would get up at three or four in the morning to do a couple of hours worth of studying before they went to work. And they would go to bed quite early, eight or nine o'clock, ten o'clock. I've got a colleague over in the States, and he seems to go to bed stunningly early because he's online fielding his emails. Bear in mind, he's on the east coast of America, five hours away from us, and you're getting emails from him at about nine or ten o'clock in the morning. Here time. So he's very much an early bird, <coughs> and I don't know quite what time he goes to bed at night, but it's obviously pretty early. I've got others, a similar sort of situation, and yeah, you pick them up 9 o'clock <coughs> their time, which is 2 o'clock here time roughly. Do you know whether you're an early bird or a night owl? Do you know when in the day is best for you? I know that if I'm marking a stack of uh, assignments between about 2 o'clock in the afternoon and about 4 o'clock in the afternoon is definitely not a good time for me. Earlier, yep. Afterwards, yep. But 2 till 3 is a disastrous time. I can comp but on the other hand, I can do quite a lot of creating presentations and so on during that time period. I can't absorb the <coughs> information then, but I can create at that time. So how does that work with you folks? Each one of you is different. And then here's one which... Although some of the traditional or the modern educationists say, oh Richard, you can't use the FARC system, it no longer is valid, we don't believe in this sort of learning styles approach of visual auditory uh, and so on and so forth. Yeah, okay, so educationists might decide this isn't quite as good, however, it is still quite important that you understand some of this because the answers to some of these questions that you can t do at the test or those two URLs, will help you again to understand yourself better. Do you understand better just listening to people, or do you have to read it yourself? Or do you actually have to do a bit more than that and actually start writing it down, making notes? Do you talk with your hands? <laughs> kind of like I do a bit. I mean, if you try to put me with my hands behind my back, I kind of have a problem, as you can see. And it's really, again, where are your strengths, where are your weaknesses? Do you learn best from a manual, or do you learn best from a YouTube explanation? Is it one example of what, how this is actually important? Do you need to go find the manual, or the text, or would you just go and watch the YouTube videos, possibly plural? Because if you know which works best for you, you don't need to waste time doing the things that don't work. And that's why VARC is still valuable, I believe. <coughs> Planning, time management, your schedule. Work out how you
you going to spend nine to five each day on your studying? Because if you do a nine to five around your studying, then you've got the evenings free if you want. You've got the weekend free to do whatever you like. If you only do two or three hours during the daytime, then you've got to work an awful lot harder at night time. Think about where. Will you do it here in the labs, in the library, uh, the learning, various open spaces around where there's PCs? Or will you do it back in your room, halls of residence, or your lo uh, wherever you're living at the moment, or at home? Where is best for you? Again, it's down to personal preference, down to the other distractions that are around you here or the distractions around you at home that might make it difficult to carry on working effectively. So again, plan it out. What's the resources? Have you got a really great <coughs> internet at your, in your room, at home or wherever? Or do you have best internet here? Again, think about it and write down your plan for how you're going to study really, really effectively. And if you want to get the source of all of these, the page numbers are on there, this is the book, The International Student's Guide. And don't be put off by the fact that it's international, it's actually all students' guide. Because everybody needs to understand the questions that have been posed in that set of questions I just raised there. So, have a think about those, work through those exercises, folks, to know yourself clearly. Okay, I'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you very much.